الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه من والاه. Such a blessing to be in front of these pure and kind, generous faces of wudu, these faces of tawheed. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to illuminate them in this world and to honor them on the day of judgment. What a beautiful set of people you are, dear brothers and sisters, and a venue that I personally have become so accustomed to being part of, at least on a yearly basis. And what makes it happen after our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala is the likes of the blessed people like yourselves. Um, pious, impious, righteous, unrighteous, practicing Muslim, not so practicing Muslim. What is the key difference between these two camps? And before that, maybe we should ask the question, which of the two camps would you put yourself under? The practicing or the not so practicing? What separates them? What is the hallmark of this group against this group? Is it that one of them is always in a state of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the others are always sinning? And the answer is a resounding no. Sins and good deeds is perhaps one difference. But is it that one group is exempt from sins and the other is always in obedience? No. Because our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Kullu bani adam khata. Every son of man is by his nature a sinner. Wa khayrul khata'een at tawabun. And the best of those sinners are the ones who repent. So in terms of sins, we're all related like that. That's a common denominator between all of us, righteous or otherwise. One of the differences that separates a sinner from a truly practicing Muslims is not the genre of sins per se, but it's the experience during and post sin. The practicing believer, even with, with his or her sins, experiences huge regret and pain and fear because they know that there are repercussions that come with sins that are not repented for. And that is why Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the companion, he said, إِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنَ يَرَى ذُنُوبَهُ كَأَنَّهُ قَاعِدٌ تَحْتَ جَبَلٌ يَخَافُ أَنْ يَقَعَ عَلَيْهِ He said, a true believer is a person who sees his or her sins as though they were a mountain hovering above his or her head. They fear that it may collapse at any moment. That's how they see their sins. That's a believer. He said, وَإِنَّ الْفَاجِرَ يَرَى ذُنُوبَهُ he said, as for the true sinner, the true rebellious one, he is an individual who sees all of his sins as mere as a fly that sits on his, ne on his nose, which he casually swats away. So notice the difference according to Ibn Mas'ud between the righteous believer and the sinner is not sins. We all commit those. It's what you feel during that sin and after that sin. The believer sees it as a mountain, it may collapse upon him or her, I need to repent and change. Whereas the sinner, the truly rebellious one, he sees his sin as a fly that sits on his nose which he casually swats away. Which of the two fits you? And that is why Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, he has mentioned no less than 40 different repercussions for sins. Read about it in his book, Al-Jawab al-Kafi. 40 repercussions that terrorize a believer in the life of this world and will harass him or her in the grave and will accompany them on the day of judgment as well. So what do we do to remedy this difficult situation? If you feel, much like I feel, that there are certain sins in our lives that we are still struggling to rid of, that's you and I, what do we do? I share with you a passage. I want you to take out your phone, first of all, if you don't mind, please and try to take note of all 10 points that I'm going to share with you this afternoon. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, Shaykh al-Islam in his Majmu'un Fatawa, he says the following, take note. He said, وَإِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنَ إِذَا فَعَلَ سَيِّئَةً فَإِنَّ عُقُوبَتَهَا تَنْدَفِعُ عَنْهُ بِعَشَرَةِ أَسْبَعٍ When a believer commits a sin, he is able to protect himself, herself, from the repercussions of that sin in 10 different ways. You may struggle to memorize them from the outset, I mean to say, 
so at least take note of their headings. I'm going to read them out to you, and then we will rewind and unpack them one after the other in what short time we have together this afternoon. Number one, for those who fear a debt that they have accrued with respect to sins that they fear may catch up with them one day or another in this world or in the next, what do you do to erase the consequence of that sin? Doesn't have to be that way. Take note of the 10. He said, number one, أن يستغفر فيغفر الله له عز وجل. The first is to engage in istighfar, to say, astaghfirullah, Allah forgive me, Allah forgive me. That's method number one. Method number two, he said, أو يتوب فيتوب الله عليه فإن التائب من الذنب كمن لا ذنب له. Or number two, he said, you engage in tawbah, repentance. He said, because the one who repents from a sin is just like the one who never committed the sin. La ilaha illallah. Number three. Or you follow up that sin with good deeds. Because good deeds, by their nature, they erase sins. That's number what? Number three. Number four. أو يدعو له إخوانه المؤمنون ويستغفرون له حيا أو ميتا. Or when your righteous brothers and sisters from the believers make dua that Allah Almighty forgives your sins, whether you are dead or alive, Allah will save you from your sins that way. It's number four. Number five. أو يهدون له من ثواب أعمالهم. You can protect yourself from the aftermath of sins. When a righteous believer gifts you the reward of some of their good deeds. What does that mean? I will share with you some information on this in a moment. Number six, أو يشفع فيه نبيه Or when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam intercedes for you on the day of judgment. Number seven, أو يبتليه الله بمصائب في الدنيا Or when Allah tests you with difficulties in the life of this world. That also erases sins. Number eight, أو يبتليه بالبرزخ والسعقة ما يكفر الله عنه به When Allah makes things difficult for a person in the grave, that also erases a person's deeds, سيئات sins. Number nine, أو يبتليه الله في عراصات يوم القيامة Or when a person is tested by Allah during the horrors and the difficulties of the day of judgment. Sins are erased that way as well. That's number what? Number nine. Number ten. أو يرحمه أرحم الراحمين Or your sins can be erased when Allah, the most merciful, chooses to have mercy upon you. La ilaha illallah. He then concludes by saying, listen to this sentence, فَمَنْ فَاتَتْهُ هَذِهِ الْعَشَرَ فَلَا يَلُومَنَّ إِلَّا نَفْسَهِ Therefore, whoever misses out on every one of these ten has no one to blame but himself. Rewind. Let's unpack them one after the other. I want to share with you something not theoretical. This is practical, something to take home with. And these are 10 jewels I want to share with you. What was number one? Who remembers? Al-istighfar. For you to say, astaghfirullah, when you make a mistake, when you commit a sin, you move your mouth and you move your heart simultaneously. And you make an apology to your Lord. My Lord, I make a mistake. Astaghfirullah. Allah forgive me and Allah erases sins. I share with you one beautiful hadith before we move on to the next. Abu Dawood narrates on the authority of Ali that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, this is a beautiful narration. He said, ma min rajulin, any human being, yudhnibu dhamba, who commits a sin, and you know your sins. فَيَقُومُ Then he stands up. فَيَتَوَضَّ And he carries out wudu. فَيُحْسِنُ wudu, And he makes it a good wudu. ثُمَّ يُصَلِّ رَكْعَتَيْنِ And then you pray two rak'ah of salah. ثُمَّ يَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ Then you do istighfar. إِلَّا غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ Allah will erase that sin. That's number what? Number one, to get engaged in istighfar. Number two, أَنْ يَتُوبُ He said when a person engages in tawbah, repentance, that also erases sins. You will now say to me, what is the difference between istighfar and tawbah? What is the difference between me saying, astaghfirullah, Allah forgive me, and repenting to Allah? Are these not the same thing? 
I say to you, there is a similarity, an overlap, but there is also a divergence, a difference. A difference is that istighfar, to say, Allah, forgive me, deals with the sins of your past. Tawbah, repentance, deals with your past, deals with your present, and corrects your future as well. And that is why Tawbah has conditions. Unlike istighfar, Tawbah has conditions because Tawbah is way more comprehensive, way more transformational. Tawbah, what are the conditions? You know them. To feel regret for the sin that you committed that deals with your past. What's condition number two? To stop the sin at the moment. Stop it. That deals with your present. And then number three, to promise Allah that you will never return to it again. That deals with your future. And so we can say that it begins with istighfar and it ends with tawbah. We can say that tawbah is the outcome and the entry to it is istighfar. The same way you can only fill a vessel when you first emptied it. Empty it, then you fill it. And that's why Allah said, وَأَنْ يَسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ ثُمَّ تُوبُوا إِلَيْهِ Do istighfar, apologize to your Lord, then turn to Him in repentance. That's number two. Are you taking note? Are you going to apply this? Number three. What was number three? To do good deeds. So what we perhaps didn't know is that the doing of good deeds not only establishes your place in Jannah, it also removes your sins simultaneously. Allah said, Inna al-hasanati yudhibna sayyat Sins or good deeds by their nature, they erase a person's sins. So you coming to this event, you tying on your hijab this morning, my sister, and being observant of your appearance before coming to an event like this, when you are reciting your Qur'an, when you are giving out in charity, when you are returning salam to another individual, or you're carrying out your salah in jama'ah, you're not just accruing a good deeds, you are automatically eliminating sins as well. Innal hasanati yudhibna sayyat. Allah said, good deeds by their nature, they eliminate sins. How kind is Allah? That's number three. Number four, he said, when righteous believers make dua for you, Allah forgive him, Allah pardon her, oh Allah have mercy, Allah allow that addiction to leave them. That benefits you and it helps you and I emerge from our sins. So ask yourself, look into your circle of friends, the five closest associates you may have, how many of them would you believe would make dua for you if you committed a sin? How many would encourage you? Who are your circle of friends? Their dua saves people. And that is why the behavior of a responsible Muslim man and woman is to make dua for other Muslims. Oh Allah, allow them to overcome that sin because it benefits them. And that is why Allah said to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكْ Ask Allah to forgive your own sins. وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ And ask Allah to forgive the sins of the believers as well. Make dua for them. When the Prophet of Allah, Nuh, he said, Rabbi ghfirli, my Allah, my Lord, forgive me. Wali walidayy, and forgive my mom and dad. Wali man dakhala bayti ya mu'minan, walil mu'minina wal mu'minat. And forgive any righteous believer who, came, who comes into my house. And the dua of Ibrahim, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who said, Rabbana ghfirli, wali walidayy, walil mu'minina, yawma yaqumu al-hisa. My Lord, forgive me, and forgive my parents. And forgive all of the believers on the day when the resurrection is established. Make dua for the righteous believers. Who are your circle of friends? Restructure it if you think that they will not make dua for you if you commit a sin. That's number what? Four. Number five, we said, Ibn Taymiyyah said, when another believer chooses to gift the reward of some of his good deeds to you, and looking at your faces, I feel that some of you, if not the majority, are hearing this for the first time, that this is actually a possibility to hand over the reward of some of your hasanat, your good deeds, to someone whom you love, as though it was a gift. According to the majority of the scholars, this is possible. In fact, Ibn Taymiyyah himself, he said that the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah are unanimously agreed that their financial acts of worship benefit people whom they are gifted for. There's no disagreement there. So I can give charity on your behalf and it benefits you. Sadaqah, 
I can free a slave on your behalf and the reward can be gifted to you from me. So there's no difference of opinion in the financial acts of worship. Then you have aspects of dua. He said the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah are also agreed that the dua you make for someone else will benefit them. The janazah salah will benefit them. Making dua at, at their grave will benefit them. He said there is however a difference of opinion in the a'malul badaniyyah, the physical acts of worship. Can I carry out a physical act of worship and then hand over the reward of the good deeds to you, for example, i.e. to recite Qur'an with the intention of the reward being for you, or to pray two rak'ah, or to do a umrah with the intention of that going to you, or to fast with the intention of that reward going to you, or vice versa. Ibn Taymiyyah said, وَالصَّوَابُ مِنْ ذَلِكَ أَنَّ جَمِيعَ هَذِهِ الْأَعْمَالِ تَصِلُ إِلَيْهِ The correct opinion is that the reward of all of these actions benefit other people. All of them. And he said, this is the madhab of Abu Hanifa and Ahmad and many of the scholars of the Malikis and the Shafi'is. That's number what? Number five. How else can I protect myself from the aftermath of sin? Number six, when the Prophet Muhammad intercedes for us on the Day of Judgment. We mentioned that. Do you remember? He وسلم, will have several intercessions on the Day of Judgment. And other Prophets will also have intercessions for their people on the Day of Judgment. However, he will be given the ultimate shafa'ah, the ultimate intercession. When all of humanity will look at the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when Allah will give him a position and a status that does not belong to anyone but him. And the day of judgment, the reckoning will begin because of his intercession and humanity will be put out of their misery because of his intercession. So you need it and I need it. And that is why Bukhari narrates on the authority of Abu Huraira that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked the question, Man as'adu nasi bi shafa'atika yawm al-qiyamati ya Rasulullah. O Messenger of Allah, who will enjoy the greatest share of your intercession on the Day of Judgment? What did he say? My family, my friends, my companions, those who have memorized the most Qur'an? No. He said, As'adu nasi bi shafa'ati yawm al-qiyama man qala la ilaha illa Allah khalisan min qalbihi. He said, the ones who will enjoy the most of my intercession on the day of judgment, they are those who say, la ilaha illa Allah, purely from their heart. Purely from their heart. When was the last time you uttered the statement of Tawheed as you felt imbued, bedazzled, and consumed with the oneness and might and sovereignty of Allah? As you say, La ilaha illallah, they will be the most happy with the shafa'a of our Prophet. That's number what? Number six. Number seven. We said, a person's sins may be erased when Allah tests you with the difficulties of life. What is it you're going through? A toothache? Is it a migraine you have? Is it an injury that hasn't healed? Is it a relationship that has recently fallen to pieces? Or is it money that you've lost? An investment that has flopped? Friends who've let you down? People who have backstabbed you? Uh, bills that you can't pay? What is it? All of these things are causes for a person's sins to be erased. Oh, merciful is Allah. He wants us to go to Jannah, but we are the ones who refuse. And that is why Ibn Mas'ud, he once came to visit the Prophet ﷺ when he was fevering. And he said to him, O Messenger of Allah, you're fevering so badly. He said, yes, the fevers I experience are twice in severity than the average human being. Ibn Mas'ud, he said, is that because Allah will give you twice the reward? He said, yes. And then he spoke about you and I. He said, ما من رجل مسلم أو ما من مسلم يصيبه أذى شوكة فما فوقها إلا كفر الله بها سيئات وحطت عنه خطاياه كما تحط الشجرة ورقها. He said, and likewise, any believer who experiences any type of harm, be it the pricking of a thorn or something worse than that, Allah will eliminate some of his sins because of it and will cause him to shed his sins the same way that a tree sheds its leaves. 
So the hardship you are going through now and the grief that you are covering in your heart that only Allah knows about it and you, your sins are automatically being erased. Allah wants Jannah for us. What was the one after it? What was the one after it? Read it out to me. The grave. Or when Allah tests people in their grave, even when you are in your grave and you're experiencing the squeezing of the grave or the darkness of the grave, the loneliness of the grave, before it is made into a garden of Jannah for the believer, sins are erased because of that suffering. Allah wants you to go to Jannah. What was number nine? We said, when a person experiences the hardships of the day of judgment, 50,000 years of worth of standing beneath a sun that is one meal from the top of your head. It is a difficult day for those who have not prepared. Sins are erased. What was number 10? When Allah Almighty chooses to have mercy on that person. Allahu Akbar. Ibn Mas'ud, he said, Allah will forgive people on the day of judgment in a way that no human mind could ever imagine. Then Ibn Taymiyyah concluded with the sentence, if you remember, he said, whoever misses out on all of these ten, then he has no one to blame but himself. I conclude by asking this question. Some of you will say, Brother Ali, you have shared with us 10 practical strategies to how we can eliminate sins after I have committed them. You may say to me, hold on, I need something before that. Help me create an, a firewall between me and sins to begin with. What can I do to prevent myself from committing those sins to begin with? It's too tempting. It's always there at the click of a button. She's always there. He's always there. It's always there. What can I do to limit my susceptibility to falling prey to these sins again and again? I share with you one last bit of advice before I leave. And it's just a conversation that took place between two of our predecessors. Ibn Qudama mentions this conversation in his book, at tawabin A man came to one of our predecessors. His name is Abu Ishaq Ibrahim ibn Adham. And he had a complaint that I have made, and I make, and perhaps many of you are making as well. He said, Ya Aba Ishaq, inni musrifun ala nafsi. Abu Ishaq, I am committing many sins. So present me with an antidote, a remedy, that will limit my desire for these sins. What did he say to him? He said, I'm going to share with you five conditions. If you're able to, able to overcome them, then guess what? You can commit whatever sin you want. Nothing will harm you. Just five obstacles you need to overcome. He said, present them. He said, the first of them, إِذَا أَرَدْتَ أَن تَعْصِيَ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ فَلَا تَأْكُلْ شَيْئًا مِنْ رِزْقِهِ When you disobey Allah Almighty, just make sure that you're not eating any of His provisions. The man said, SubhanAllah, how can I not eat from the provisions that belong to Allah, whilst all of the, rizq, the provisions of life belong to Him. He said, my brother, does it make sense to you to eat from the rizq of Allah, His provisions, and then disobey Him using that provision and the energy He gave you? He said, no, of course not. Please present me the second. He said, the second is the following. If you want to disobey Allah Almighty, just make sure that you don't live on his land. He said, this is more difficult than the first. How can I not live on his land when the east and the west is from his land? He said, brother, does it make sense that you eat from his provisions? You live on his land and you disobey him. He said, absolutely not. Can you give me the third? He said, إِذَا أَرَدْتَ أَن تَعْصِيَ اللَّهَ فَانْظُرْ مَوْضِعًا لَا يَرَاكَ فِيهِ فَعْصِهِ فِيهِ when you want to disobey your Lord, at least find a corner on the planet where he can't see you and disobey him there. He said, how can I do that? Whilst he reads my very thoughts. I can't do that. He said, brother, does it make sense to you to eat from the food of Allah and to live in the land of Allah and you know you are under the eye of Allah and then you disobey Allah? He said, absolutely not. Can you give me the fourth? He said, إِذَا جَاءَكَ مَلَكُ الْمَوْتِ لِيَأْخُذَ رُوحَكَ 
فَقُلْ لَهُ أَخِرْنِي حَتَّى أَتُوبَ إِلَى اللَّهِ تَوْبَةً نَصُوحًا He said the fourth is that when the angel of death finally comes to claim your soul, say to him, don't take my soul, give me just a moment to apologize to Allah. He said, you and I know that he will not accept that from me. He said, فَكَيْفَ تَرْجُ الْخَلَاصِ So how can you hope for any security? He said, brother, give me the fifth. He said, إِذَا جَاءَتْكَ الزَّبَانِيَةُ لِيَجُرُّوكَ إِلَى النَّارِ فَلَا تَذْهَبْ مَعَهُمْ he said to him, on the day of judgment, when the gatekeepers of hell come to you from the masses to take you to hell, don't go with them. He said, you know that they will not accept this from me. He said, فَكَيْفَ تَرْجُ النَّجَاةِ So how can you hope for any safety after this? After this, he said to Abu Ishaq, Hasbi, Hasbi, meaning, please, this is enough, this is sufficient, don't say any more. أَنَا أَتُوبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ إِلَيْهِ I have turned to Allah in repentance and I have apologized to him once and for all and he remained close to Ibrahim ibn Adham worshipping Allah Almighty until death separated between them. Brothers and sisters, for those of you who wish to turn a new leaf with their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, the path is clear and more importantly, the opportunity is still there. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to transform all of those sins into hasanat. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give al-firdaus al-a'la to us and our siblings and our children, to our mothers and our fathers and our teachers, and all of those people who have a right upon us, and the organizers of this event, and all of those who are participating in it. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.